Rolling Stones is Tattoo You. And at the moment, the Rolling Stones are over there in the United States of America, grossing something like $25 million on their current tour. Now, Richard Skinner went over to Florida recently to have a chat with Mick Jagger, and we'll hear that in a while. But just before that, a fellow that appears on three of the tracks on Tattoo You is the man who is described as being the father of real modern tenor playing. His name is Sonny Rollins. And Sonny, uh, we discovered, was quite happy to tell us how he actually got involved in the Stones album, Tattoo You. We were working at a club, uh, the bottom line, it's a nightclub in New York. Uh, so there was Showcase Club, they call it. And um, Mick Jagger was there one night, of course, because it was a big commotion. Everybody, oh, Mick Jagger's in the house, you know. So um, I didn't hear anything from about it uh, till perhaps six, seven months later when uh, the people from Atlantic Records, who we're not affiliated with, uh, called us and they, uh, we, we were out of town at the time. We got a message that they had called. So uh, we were wondering, gee, I wonder what they wanted, you know. So we found out then that uh, Mick Jack wanted us to, uh, you know, was interested in me doing something with them. So finally we got together, we talked at least on the phone about it, and um, he sent over uh, some material that they had recorded uh, for me to listen to. You know, I said, well, let me listen to it and see if I can relate to it. I feel there's anything I can do with it, you know. And uh, I'd heard the Stones, of course, but I wasn't really familiar with all of their stuff, you know. So um, uh, he sent over the cassette of some of the tracks that they had done and uh, some of the basic tracks, I think, they were added, they added things later. And uh, there were some things there which I thought I could um, uh, relate to. In two days, you've had about 120,000 kids crammed into the auditorium there, or the, the, the open-air stadium. Yeah. Must have been a lot of gross money taken and things like that. Could you have expected this um, tour to have had that amazing reaction when you first planned to do it? Not really, no. It's, we got a bit stuck with, because um, we only booked 20 dates. So, uh, and we booked, say, for Orlando. We thought, well, we'll do Orlando, this one outdoor. But then it sold out so quickly that we uh, had to find another date. And they're not always easy to come by two in a row. Because mm. it was booked for football or baseball. I mean, there was so many sports, you know. So, um, you know, we had to double up in the gig. So in that way, it's kind of almost twice as many people as we expected. I don't really know why uh, people are so interested. Uh, I just think maybe, see, hardly any bands really toured this year in an outdoor uh, stadium. And also we're doing all these domes, which are these, uh, which is like an outdoor stadium covered. Yes. We're doing a lot of those. And they maybe, I think, see, people underestimate the people that just like to come to those outdoor gigs are, Maybe you had a hard time. We just had a few people in here from England that had come over and had a hard time in there. But very young kids especially, I think, like to get down the front and everything. And uh, no bands have been touring much this summer, so we hit the last bit of the summer and they just uh, out there buzzing, you know. Yeah, and the way you're leaping around the stage rather you, you belies your maturity. Well, it's a long way at stage. It's like, um, you know, instead of playing just at the end of the stage and trying to make those things out, it's got out into the audience. Right, it's about it's over a hundred yards, I'd imagine, from one end to another. Yeah. So basically, we've got this front bit, and then it goes out on two side ramps, but it's a long way because it's a stadium, you know. But um, I think it's a good idea, actually, which weirdly no one's ever really done. Mm. And um, so, because it just you need at least three stages in a big stadium like that, and then you're only covering like a third of it. Who has the ideas for the staging of shows like this? Is it you, or do you have graphic designers who come? Well, in? yeah, you have. Like, you listen to a lot of people's ideas and then basically you make up your mind that nicking all the bits from theirs, I think. Mostly Charlie and I get involved in the, in the stage design. I know a couple of years ago you did a, a, a tour in the USA of smaller venues. Do you ever get the hankering still to get back to that rather more familiar atmosphere? Well, tomorrow night, as it happens, we're playing in the Atlanta Fox Theatre, which is, I think, 2,000 seats, oh, which right. is quite small. Yes. After 65 or whatever it was today. Yes. 
So, you know, yeah, we'd get back in to do that. I just wonder how you communicate with those folk right at the back of the you football. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they can hear something. Yeah. You know, you communicate them sound like they can't see much. I mean, I went out there in the L.A. show, and the Jay Giles band were on. You know, I mean, you can't see Peter Wolf from his binoculars. <laughs> But the people are up there with their hampers and their iceboxes, you know, it's bizarre. The crowd seems to be as much putting on a show as, as you are, in a sense. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know, in a big gig, which is why I think people like them, in a big gig like that, I mean, they all dress up and get absolutely out of their skulls. And, um, yeah, they are. I mean, whereas uh, if you go to an evening arena, like um, 10,000 people or something like that, they don't eat. They expect you to do everything, mm. which is the reverse. Because you can't really play to all those people, you know, they're, they're just there to have a good time. When you do an outdoor show, you've got to basically do very similar things because you can't hear the band all the time. You, um, so, you, you know, uh, a lot of it's in the... It's difficult to play any, with any subtlety. So you've just got to bang away at the things you, you know best, basically. This time round, you, it's like a sort of retrospective for you, isn't it, this show, really? I mean, especially the last portion of the performance, which was like non-stop oldies. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bit in the middle which is all new, and then That's right. you know, yeah, it's a bit of everything, really. But um, a lot of the kids in the today's crowd only n know the last three albums. So if you go out there and do Satisfaction, they say, "Hey, they've got a new song." Well, they know that one. They know that one, but they don't know hardly any others, and so they only know like from Miss You onwards, mm. which is kind of weird. So. <laughs> but we do the other ones anyway. Most of it is new. I mean, I.e. the last three years. Mm. It's only. A third of it is old. And then you've got to be able to bring to it something new, because if it doesn't spark, then it's just old garbage. You, you might, know, as well might as well just play the record out, or something. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. just kick it out, because there's plenty of other songs. And we have a lot of songs. Um, and we have a lot of sort of radio songs, you know, that have been played a lot, that people know. Like we discover one, for instance, which we'd never played, which is Let It Bleed, right, which is, OK, from the LP of the same name. Um, and which we'd never played on stage you know, before. But it wasn't really a popular number, radio was, but people liked it. Mm. So, yeah, there you go. You just find these odd songs, and you'd be lucky. <laughs> I mean, I only did it once in the recording studio, maybe three times. A long and spectacular set in which, uh, amongst one of, the, one of the things that happens, you're slung out on the end of a crane over the audience. Oh, that's great, yeah, wonderful. It's worth at night, because you can't see anything. Yeah. But I just explain to because we're not on the TV or anything. Yeah. Well, it's just a crane that we used to put up the things, goes about 80 foot up in the air, so it starts, and I go like 80 foot out into the audience and up and down and like and it takes about um, two minutes to ride. It's like a ride on a fair. Mm. But it is a ride on a fair, and I'm a bit scared up there sometimes. <laughs> and I, but it's, uh, people like it. But you get a different perspective, you know. And we've got, we need it to put the nuts and bolts at the top anyway. We <laughs> do, that's what it's for. for. Yeah, it's called a cherry picker. <laughs> Must be useful for you also to get out there and have a look and see what the show is looking like, you know, why? Oh, have yeah. a chance to look back well, and see I can well. hear it keeps playing. Yes. Really, I can hear what the PA sounds like. Mick, I, I gather that you're doing America, but it's not in any way a, a world tour for the Rolling Stones, or even um, a British tour, you know, coming up next. I mean, why is it just the States at the moment? Respectfully, I mean, there are lots of places in the world where we've never even ever been, mm. where they want us to go for more money or whatever, you know. So is, is it a financial question? Well, it's got to be partially. It's not totally financial, but I mean, everyone when they go on a job wants to earn money. So it has to be, you know, if you say, look, OK, next year you can tour Australia and you're going to make, you know, X amount of pounds and you're going to tour Europe and lose money, you know, you're going to... But you, you don't have to tour Europe and lose money, but Europe's very hard to tour because you don't want to just tour the UK alone. I mean, you, you know, the, uh, most bands want to tour Europe, you know, OK, you spend whatever time in the UK, whatever it is, how many weeks, four weeks, but while you're in the UK, you want to go to France, etc. And it starts to get strange, you know, and, mm. You can't play what we call back to back because the frontiers, you know, every time. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it is problematical, but a lot of bands do it very well and we just have to do it better. Because I've come out of those long tours of Europe earning no, no money, which, okay, big deal, you know. And they, they don't, they're not going to cry for me because I'm making the money here. 
So, yeah, okay, we maybe you just have to approach it like we're going to lose money. Mm. But it seems silly to me to, to lose money. You know? Daft. Yeah. So at the moment, definitely no plans for it. Well, no, we want to do it. So on our number one on our list, even though that Australia is and all that is much more money. Yes. And much less work. It's a truly a matter of work, much harder than this three months tour of America is easy compared to two months tour of Europe. Just because of those practical problems Just you're talking about, frontiers, it's much more travel. efficient here. That's yeah. All. I mean, the UK is efficient, you know. But you know, once you get out of there, you know, if you try going to Italy and Spain and all that and you know, I suppose the answer is to the UK only, but you know, that's then, then really it's unfair to get Europe. Yeah, you know, then yes, they're all yeah. monitors in Germany. Hey, we're buying your records. You know. Do you work at other things? I mean, I don't know whether you have other business. No, I don't have any business. I have no petrol station. I have no grocery shop. <laughs> no farms or whatever. Oh, I have no farms. Yeah. I have no cattle. I have nothing. No, I mean, no. I mean, I don't have any way of making money apart from this. We'll talk a bit about Tatuya, the album, which um, is interesting because it's not a, an album. You didn't go in to record an album as such. It was a, a mixture of old and new material, wasn't it, that had been hanging around? Well, some of it's new and some of it isn't new. I mean, but all of it's, all the vocals and words and everything are new, and all the mixes and overdubs are new. What Hang Fire, well, maybe we did that two or three years ago. Then the next year we came and said, what band that, can't we do that better, do it again. Mm -hmm. Then I'll change the middle eight, rewrite it, do the words again. Six months later, you do it again. Well, you know, and that, you use that one. I always say, no, go back to that one we did three years ago. That was there. You know, and that's how it works. From the album Tattoo You, that of course is the Rolling Stones and Hang Fire. Really nice to hear Mick Jagger talking in a sort of easy fashion. He was talking there to Richard Skinner on location in Orlando in Florida.